If you have flown in a short to medium range modern airliner, like the Airbus A320 or the Boeing 737 in the last couple of decades, you may have noticed only two people are responsible for operating the aircraft, the pilot and the co-pilot. Or better yet, if you have flown modern airliners in a simulator like FSX or X-Plane 11, you may have noticed that you are able to fly the aircraft all by yourself with a relatively small workload. But how is this possible? So many systems requiring monitoring, so many in-flight tasks needing to be completed, so many variables that if overlooked can result in the loss of all lives on board. Well, thanks to the modern computer, which its principle was only proposed around 80 years ago by Alan Turing, today we have the FMS, the Flight Management System, aka the brains of the modern airliners. The FMS is a fundamental component of a modern airline's avionics. It is a specialized computer system that automates a wide variety of in-flight tasks, reducing the workload on the flight crew, this enabling such a small crew required to safely fly the airliner. But before we jump into the details regarding what the FMS is and how it works, let's talk about how airliners operated before the FMS was introduced. Let's go all the way back to the world's first commercial jet airliner, the, the Havilland Comet which debuted with great promise in 1952. The Comet, with a eye-watering capacity of 36 passengers, required four people to operate. Let's talk about these positions. Number one, the captain. The captain is the main pilot, the person legally in charge of the aircraft and its flight safety and operation, and would normally be the primary person liable for an infraction of any flight rule. He does not necessarily need to be actually manipulating the flight controls at any given moment, but he is responsible for whatever is going on in the cockpit. Number 2. The first officer. He is the second pilot. In the event of the captain being incapacitated, he must assume the captain role. The control of the aircraft is normally shared equally between the two pilots. While one of them is piloting, the other one is monitoring. Number 3. The flight engineer. He is primarily concerned with the operation and monitoring of all aircraft systems and is required to diagnose and where possible rectify or eliminate any faults that may arise. On most multi-engine airplanes, the flight engineer sets and adjusts engine power during takeoff, climb, cruise, go-arounds or any time the pilot flying requests a specific power setting to be set during the approach phase. The flight engineer sets and monitors major systems, including fuel, pressurization and air conditioning, hydraulic, electricity, generators, auxiliary power units, gas turbine compressors, air turbine motor, ice and rain protection for the engines, windows and probes. He is responsible of the oxygen, fire and overheat protection of all systems, cooling systems and power flying controls. He is also responsible for the pre-flight and post-flight aircraft inspections and ensuring that the weight and balance of the aircraft is correctly calculated to ensure the center of gravity is within its limits. They also monitor an aircraft's flight path, speed and altitude. A significant portion of their time is spent cross-checking pilot sections. The flight engineer is the systems expert of the airplane, with an extensive mechanical and technical knowledge of the aircraft systems and aircraft performance. Number four. The Air Navigator. He is responsible for an aircraft's flight navigation, including its dead reckoning and celestial navigation. Dead reckoning being the process of calculating one's current position by using a previously determined position or fix and advancing that position based upon known or estimated speeds over elapsed time and course. It could be said it is kinda guessing your current position. Celestial navigation, on the other hand, is a practice of position fixing that enables a navigator to transition through a space without having to rely on estimated calculations or dead reckoning to know their position. This by angular measurements taken between a celestial body like the Sun, Moon, Planet, Polaris or any of the 57 navigational stars whose coordinates are tabulated in the Air Almanacs. This role was especially important when flying over oceans or other large featureless areas where radio navigation aids were not originally available. This was the crew required to safely fly the first commercial jetliner. Four people. All of them with incredible amounts of workload. And today, we can safely fly the same routes with about 10 times the passenger count with only two people in the cockpit. 
all thanks to the FMS. The FMS is so powerful that it has reduced the level of workload in the cockpit to a point where flight engineers and air navigators are no longer required. So what is the FMS and what does it do? As mentioned before, it is the brains of the aircraft. It gathers information from all of the aircraft sensors, it processes all of this information in real time, displays this information to the pilots on demand, alerts the pilots if anything is not inside acceptable parameters, or if it has conflicting data. It also automatically completes tasks previously had to be completed manually, and of course, the primary function of the FMS in flight management of the flight plan. In other words, navigates the aircraft. Okay, so the FMS is just a computer, right? Uh, kinda, yeah. It actually is a dual system consisting of a FMC, being the flight management computer, and a CDU, this being the control display unit. This can be represented as a desktop computer. The FMC is the case with all of the computing goodies inside of it, where the CDU is your screen and keyboard. The FMC plus the CDU makes the FMS. Okay, so the pilot inputs the flight information to the FMC via the CDU. And in return, the FMC displays the flight plan on the FS, this being the electronic flight instrument system, the NDs, these being the navigation displays, or MFDs, these being the multifunctional displays. Now let's dive a little deeper into the navigation capabilities of the FMS. The FMS, as mentioned, is very powerful, but at the same time, a little dumb. When you start up the FMS, it has no idea where it is. It has an assumption of where it is based on where it was last powered off. But this is just an assumption, and the pilot is responsible of telling the FMS where they are at. The FMS will basically utilize the data given by the pilot, and then three sensors to determine its position inside the flight plan. The three sensors will be named number one IRS, no not that one, number two GPS, and number three VORDME. Let's take a look into these. Number one IRS. The inertial reference system is a self-contained navigation technique in which measurements provided by accelerometers and gyroscopes are used to track the position and orientation of an object relative to a known starting position. What this means is that once the pilot inputs the position and the IRS initializes, it does not require and will not receive any external inputs. This is great as it is immune to jamming and deception. The IRS does need to align. This process can take around 10 minutes on startup. At this time, it is able to sense the rotation of the Earth thanks to its gyroscopes. With this, it is able to determine where it is in latitude within a 30 mile precision. If you are off these 30 miles in your input, the IRS will throw red flags. Now regarding longitude, the IRS is not able to deduce where it is, so it can be fooled in this area. But it does remember where it was last shut down. So if this varies more than one degree from your input, it will throw red flags again. But the pilot can force the FMS to accept that longitude. One issue inertial navigation systems suffer from is the integration drift. Basically small errors in measurement. Those add up as time passes by, but that is a whole another topic. So in summary, the IRS is a self-contained navigation system based on accelerometers and gyroscopes that depend on pilot input for initialization. Let's go to number two, GPS. Global Positioning System, or better said, GNSS. Global Navigation Satellite System is the most popular modern navigation system. Provides geolocation and time information to a GPS receiver anywhere on or near the Earth, where there is an unobstructed line of sight to four or more GPS satellites. GPS is pretty cool as it does not require the user to transmit any data. It operates independently of any telephonic or internet reception, and it is absolutely free. It is maintained by US taxpayers' money. The bad thing about the GPS is that the signals are pretty weak. 
and can be blocked by numerous obstacles. Atmospheric effects can cause errors as well as natural or artificial interference. So in summary, GPS is pretty great, but it is completely external, this being a strength and a weakness, and it is not 100% reliable. GPS does not and will never navigate a commercial airliner. The navigation is done by the FMS. The GPS throws position updates to the FMS, as well as the other sensors. The FMS evaluates the information and navigates accordingly. Number 3. VOR DME This is basically radio navigation. A VOR DME is a radio beacon that combines a VHF omnidirectional range VOR, with a distance measuring equipment DME. The VOR allows the receiver to measure its bearing to or from the beacon, while the DME provides the slant distance between the receiver and the station. Together, the two measurements allow the receiver to compute a position fix. They are pretty great, but of course, they have their own issues. Radio waves do not follow the contour of the Earth, and the Earth not being flat, well, you can imagine. So yeah, depending on your range and altitude, you may not be able to receive a signal. Mountains can also block the signal. Or the beacon may just present some problems. Alright, now we know the three different position inputs that the FMS receives for position determination. Obviously there is much more to them, but uh, I, I tried to keep them as simple as possible. But what it is important to take from this is that none of these inputs directly navigate the aircraft. The FMS constantly cross-checks the various sensor and determines a single aircraft position and accuracy. This means that it is extremely important that the pilot inputs the correct location of the aircraft when initializing the FMS, as this input is critical to the system. And it also means if one of these sensors fails for any reason, it has other sensors it can utilize to still be able to determine its position and continue with the flight. Now we know how the FMS figures out where we are, but what about everything around us? All FMS contain a navigation database. These are updated every 28 days in order to ensure that the contents are current. This results in ERAC cycles. This video was created on November 2019, so the current ERAC cycle is 1911. So now what does the database contain? Waypoints, intersections, airways, radio navigation aids including distance measuring equipment, this being the DME, VHF omnidirectional rain, the VORs, non-directional beacons, NDBs, and instrument landing systems, ILSs. It has airports, runways, standard instrument departures called SIDs, standard terminal arrivals called STARS, holding patterns, instrument approach procedures. Pretty much all of the navigation information required for your flight is saved locally in your FMC. You just need to set your position correctly and create your flight plan. Now speaking about the flight plan, the flight plan is generally determined on the ground, before departure. It is entered into the FMS either by typing it in, selecting it from a saved library of common routes, this would be company routes, or via an ACARS data link with the airline dispatch center. The flight plan is not set in stone and can be changed during the flight. The FMS is very flexible. It is quite simple to do so as well. You may want to change a flight plan for various reasons, but we won't dive much into this. What I will be doing later on is input a flight plan into a Boeing 737 FMS as an example. But before jumping into the FMS example, let's talk about one last point regarding the FMS. Airliners have the option to enable navigation autopilot. This turns the aircraft left or right with a limit on the bank angle previously selected by the pilot. This in order to fly the selected route. But aircraft are not like cars, which their routes are two-dimensional. Aircraft routes are three-dimensional. So there is another navigation mode available called VNAV. VNAV, aka Vertical Navigation, predicts and optimizes the vertical path. 
It can also control the pitch axis of the aircraft and can also control the throttle. The FMS does require some information before takeoff in order for it to be able to activate VNAV. Information such as aircraft model, engine models, aircraft performance, aircraft empty weight, fuel weight, center of gravity, initial cruise altitude, the lateral flight plan, temperatures, etc. Before even taking off, with the information properly set, the FMS can already predict where the aircraft will reach the top of climb and where it reaches the top of descent as to in that moment start the descent and arrive at the desired altitude, speed and position for landing. All of this having into consideration the most efficient path for fuel consumption. We now have a good idea of what the FMS is, what it does and how it does this. Let's now have a look at the user interface for the FMS. The CDU. These shown here are two different CDUs. One is from the Boeing's 737 and the other is from the Airbus's A320. They are very similar, but they do have a couple of very important differences, which may be discussed in another video. For this video, we will focus on Boeing's CDU. The 737's CDU can be divided into five areas. Number one, the screen. Number two, the screen keys. We got six on the left, six on the right. Number three, function keys. Number four, keypad. And number five, number pad. Now let's see how this all works. Let's now jump into the simulator and set up the FMC via the CDU. Hello, welcome aboard. This is your captain speaking, Crosscheck. And today we're going to input a flight plan into the FMS of this beautiful Boeing 737-900. Okay, so I just realized how long this video already is, so I'm going to divide the next part into a new video. You can find the link to that video on this video's description. Thank you for making it all the way up to this point. I truly appreciate it. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my one and only patron, Punda. Thank you very much, sir. Anyway, yeah, see you in the next video. Happy flying, cross check out.